welcome to another episode of Ask, Seek and Knock. Uh, in this episode, we will have two presenters. I am the host. My name is Yana. that's going to uh, be in, in the first half of the show. And then my husband, Dr. Thomas Carr, a theologian. So if you have any question, uh, you can call the number on the screen. Uh, give us any, anything pertaining to Catholic Church, to uh, spiritual life, to prayer life, theology, anything. So you can give us a call. And so uh, welcome, Father Ignatius. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. You're it's better to be in Ave. Maria, like I was just a few days ago, than to be zoomed in, but hey, this is I know, second best, I guess. I know, yeah. Father Ignatius and Father Jesse were here. We did retreat last last week already. My goodness. We were in the studio all together, and that was amazing. Yeah, we miss you guys. Ave Maria, miss you guys. <laughs> it was Ave amazing. Maria. Yes. Soon and very soon, we can do it again, hopefully. Yes, yes. Well, Father, do you want to open, open us up in prayer? Sure. Sure. Let's turn uh, first to our Blessed Mother, Queen of Preachers. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. God of truth, we approach you, knowing that you stand firm amidst all the changes in this world that you remain uh, shining even amidst the world's darkness. Open our minds and hearts to you. Help us to know you more, help us to love you more, and share your truth and love with the world. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 So, um, well, today, according to the traditional calendar, is a very special day for our order, the Orders of Preacher, Dominican Order, right? And I know also in the normal calendar, on Monday is the same, so it's the Feast of St. Dominic of Guzman, right? Well, That's Father, right. maybe some of our audience doesn't know who he is. Maybe you can share with us a little bit, who is he? Who is St. Dominic of Guzman? Yeah, so St. Dominic is the uh, founder of the Order of Preachers, the Dominicans. And who is St. Dominic? Well, he's like a dog with a torch in its mouth, running around the world, uh, shedding the light of Christ, setting the world ablaze with God's love. So St. Dominic's mother, Jane of Aza, whose feast day that we as Dominicans um, celebrated on Tuesday, Jane of Aza had a dream of about St. Dominic when she was pregnant with St. Dominic, and she had a dream about this dog running around the world with a torch in its mouth, uh, setting the world ablaze with God's love and the gospel. And so uh, that's why, as you may know, uh, the Dominican order is often <coughs> represented by a dog with a torch in its mouth, and uh, St. Dominic is often depicted with that, that dog. But I think that, that does capture something really true about St. Dominic. There is kind of a, a doggedness about him, his life of prayer, his life of asceticism, um, and then he is setting the world ablaze. Something manly about the image of the dog too. Uh, who let the dogs out? You know, the dogs of the Lord. Um, and so to be part of that family, to be part of that that army, uh, that mission of Saint Dominic with proclaiming the gospel um, and preaching the truth, opening up the truth of the gospel. Uh, is attractive, and that's what we Dominicans are still about uh, today. Okay, and it's interesting, you know, Martin Luther used, he would call the Dominicans, and he used um, the word dogs of the Lord based on the Latin of Dominicanus, Domini Canus, dog of the Lord. Uh, he used that as a slur against the Dominicans, these dogs, these dogs of the Lord. Uh, but, you know, in our own context, it could have a much more positive uh, sense to be a dog of the Lord. And uh, our own Hillbilly Thomas have a beautiful song about being a dog with the torch of its mouth for the Lord. <laughs> uh, so you can catch that on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, that's actually my favorite uh, song. I would play over and over again, and my son was like, okay, Mom, no more, enough. <laughs> 
Yes, I feel like I'm that. <laughs> the dog of the Lord, it. right? <laughs> yeah, got to be scrappy like that dog of the Lord. Exactly. Um, and so maybe you can tell us a little bit about him. Like, why did he, you know, uh, found the order? What's what's the reason? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so I'll tie the, this to something you brought in as well a little up a little earlier. And so today, yeah, in the traditional calendar, today is St. Dominic's Feast Day. Um, and now it's August 8th. And so, you know, normally the feast day of a saint would be on the day he dies. And so St. Dominic died on August 6th, which is the feast of the transfiguration of the Lord. So, of course, they had to move him. So then um, you know, he couldn't be on the same feast day as the Transfiguration. Um, and so the old calendar moved him to August 4th. But then you have St. John Biani, who died on that day. And so August 4th became St. John Biani's feast day in the new calendar. And so Dominic got bumped again now to two days after his day of death. Uh, August 8th is his current feast day. But it is worth noting that him dying on the Feast of the Transfiguration also captures something about St. Dominic. So on the one hand, you have the image of the dog with the torch on its mouth. On the other hand, you have the mystery of the Lord Jesus' Transfiguration. That's kind of like a, a divinely provided for epilogue to St. Dominic's life. And it captures something about him. You know, the light of Christ, the light of God shining through the humanity of Christ on Mount Tabor, that place of prayer. And St. Dominic being that man of prayer and letting that light of the gospel shine through him. So there's something profound about St. Dominic dying on the Feast of Transfiguration, something very providential. And it does capture this mission of transmitting lights to be on the mountaintop, receiving the light of the Lord and then to pass that on to others. Or as St. Thomas will put it after St. Dominic, to contemplate and to hand on what is contemplated. And personally, I like to add another phrase to that, to contemplate, to hand on what's contemplated, and to uh, we ourselves to be handed over to the one contemplated mm. is implied in that. So that's St. Dominic, he's bathed in the light of the Transfiguration, and that captures something about him and the charism he's left uh, to us, Dominicans, to carry out. So this came to a kind of a fruition in St. Dominic's life, or to a, a culmination in a way. He was traveling with his bishop, Diego, um, somewhere, and they, they went through the countryside and they met all these, these heretics who were uh, preaching uh, falsehoods and preaching things not good for the human being. You know, the sense of the, the human body being bad, the spirit's good, the body's bad. Um, a form of Manichaeism, Albigensianism was the, uh, what it's called in, in this, this form, the 1200s. And so he saw that and his heart went out to all these souls who were lost, who were deceived. And so that led, that was the inspiration, or God used that to inspire St. Dominic to found the Dominicans, the order of preachers, to have learned preachers who would be contemplatives, who would be, who would study, and who would be able to combat this heresy of Albigensianism and other errors out there, and let the full light of Christ, the full light of God shine, and to give a, a profound articulation of that. So thus began the Dominicans, and, and thus we continue today. Mm -hmm. I guess there's, there's, there's uniqueness, I know, learning about the history of the Dominican order, how, you know, I guess before only the bishop can preach, right? And, and starting with the order, now you have this uh, priest that are now preaching everywhere. Isn't that something that, that he established? Is that right? Exactly, exactly. So before that, yeah, just the priest, just the bishop could do doctrinal preaching, parish priests, you know, could do kind of moral exhortation. But as far as doctrinal opening up of the faith, that was reserved to the bishop. So it was something unique and provocative to have an order of priests uh, opening up the riches of the Catholic faith. And the other sort of provocative thing or the new thing about the Dominicans 
was before the friar movements like this uh, Dominicans and Franciscans and Carmelites and Augustinians. You just had monks. And so religious life was just conceived as being in a monastery, being um, withdrawn from the world. You know, Benedictines would kind of be the main form of religious life. And then you have some hermit groups like the Carthusians or Camaldolis. And so this with the friar movement in the 1200s, kind of inspired by a return to the gospels and wanting to live like the apostles did, gathering together in prayer, gathering together, having all possessions in common and poverty and uh, going out and preaching. And so it was a new thing in the um, arena of religious life to have religious who are not simply monks cloistered, but who would go out into the world. And so St. Dominic was still very monastic you know, he would spend his nights in prayer and then he would give his days uh, to men and women as he served them. And so he kept a lot of the monastic practices in the Dominican order, but we did have this uh, outreach element as well, going out and preaching in a pastoral ministry. And so it was a, a new chapter in um, the Catholic Church and, and religious life within the Catholic Church. Okay. Um. What do you think is the impact of the Dominican order in the life of the church from the beginning until now? What do you think is unique about our order? What do you think? Yeah, I would say we're still on that mountain of transfiguration, still receiving the light and letting that shine forth, but just in different contexts, different historical contexts, places, the needs of our, our times. And it is interesting, you know, the rich charism of St. Dominic led to, you know, a variety of different saints. So St. Thomas Aquinas is the one we often turn to first, and he does capture, you know, obviously something profound about the Dominican charism. But let's not forget about all the other Dominican saints. And by the way, among all the religious orders, the Dominicans have the most number of saints and blesseds. And that's why our Dominican litany is so long, <laughs> why it's so powerful. Uh, 115 so or something, 112 <laughs> went on and on and on, yes. <laughs> that's right. And, and just learning again as, as a Dominican, learning all these saints that I don't even know they exist or don't even know, it's incredible, the Dominican saints, you know, St. Vincent Ferrer, for example, right? The miracles yeah. that happen in his life. Who, who is this person? You know, St. Agnes Man Mante Polciano, for example, you know, when she, she was consecrated, there's mana in the whole church was covered with mana, mana with a cross, the whole church. It's like, wow. that's just one of them, and I don't even know her. So yeah, the Dominican saints are insane. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, great family to be a part of, exactly. the, the Dominican family. And it is, it all springing from St. Dominic's charism. Yeah. Uh, shedding light into the world, the truth of the gospel, on fire with charity from St. Thomas Aquinas, very learned, to a very simple man, St. Martin de Porras. Yes. Humble, uh, simple, uh, serving the poor, uh, grounded in the truth. Or someone like St. Catherine of Siena, who brings kind of great intellect and wisdom to the spiritual life. And so all this bringing forth from the heart of St. Dominic in all uh, different ways, um, showing forth the charisma of, of the Dominicans. And so it does just show how rich truth is in the Catholic faith, a truth ablaze with love and just the many different ways it, it can shine forth. Yeah. You know, they said of St. Dominic, and this is what really captivates my heart about him, and it has from the beginning, is that he always Pray, he always either spoke with God or about God. So his whole life was caught up in speaking with God in prayer uh, or speaking about God and proclaiming the gospel, evangelizing. So that, that ideal has always stood out in my mind as uh, what also is at the heart of the Dominican charism or should be uh, this life rooted in prayer, always speaking to God uh, or about God, about you know, the important things, things that are going to last, uh, weighty things, um, God, to speak about God and to be rooted in God and to be able to do that. Yeah. 
I, I know, you know, we have a lay Dominican group here in Ave Maria. We, my husband and I, we lead them and started them. But the question always come up in terms of lay Dominican. People say, well, Dominicans order, they're just for smart people, Thomas Aquinas, the one that can read the Summa. I, I have difficulty reading the Summa. My husband does, who's a professor. It's not easy. You need, you need you know, philosophy, you need Aristotle. But I always tell them I am, I am drawn into the Dominican order because of St. Dominic, because of his prayer, St. Catherine Siena, not really Thomas Aquinas, although he is a man of prayer, but that's not the reason. I always say either you, you can be drawn to him by intellect or by heart, by prayer. And I think, I think St. Dominic has both. I mean, he's such a man of prayer, you know. So maybe, maybe one of the things I want to ask too, since now you're the promoter of the lay Dominican, for for the audience that are watching too, uh, what what is it? Why do you need? Why do people need to be a lay? Not need, but what's the advantage of being a lay Dominican or or a lay of some kind of an order, but especially Dominican? Yeah, it's about, I guess, being united to a family with a similar purpose, particular niche within the church, you're drawn to it, then to be in a deeper communion with them. I just found out last night, some of my brothers were sharing that for a while, that Dominicans were known as having the most like indulgences or we pray for our, our dead more than most other orders. So there was some kind of saying like, um, you know, it's best to, to die a Dominican because you get all these people praying for you and um, all our suffragists offered for, for the dead. And so there's that side of being a part of a Dominican. I mean, not simply prayers for you as you die, but to be united um, in that spiritual communion and having the prayers of others um, influence your own life and to be united in a special way through being part of the Dominican lady or the Dominican family. And for me, I mean, another way to think about St. Dominic and something that captures him is what uh, Jordan of Saxony says about him. Blessed Jordan of Saxony was the first biographer of St. Dominic. He knew St. Dominic, received the habit from St. Dominic. And he referred to St. Dominic simply as a man of the gospel, Vir Evangelicus. And that captures something about him. You know, you and I, we can like be interested in the gospel, do, do the gospel part time, but it was no everything. He was a man of the gospel. Jordan of Saxony says everywhere in word and deed, he showed himself to be a man of the gospel. You know, his whole humanity, his whole life was taken up into living out the gospel, to receiving it, and then living it out. And so he did that in a profound way. And the Dominican order, the Dominican charism, uh, leads us in a special way uh, down that road. Following the way of the gospel, especially under the aspect of truth, the solid rock that the gospel offers us, the truth of God, the truth of God's love, and building our lives on that in the midst of the storms of life, in the midst of the own storms that enter our own souls and emotions sometimes. Uh, the truth of the gospel and uh, on that foundation being men and women of the gospel. Okay, well, we have two more minutes, Father. Last question, I don't know if this oh, wow. is easy or not to ask, but yeah. uh, do you think the Dominican orders, the friars, the laity, the orders, do you think they still follow the tradition of St. Dominic in terms of prayer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, uh, we always need to grow. And uh, it is interesting. So with the Second Vatican Council and the call to, to renew religious life and the rewriting of constitutions of religious orders, um, our, we, we changed the term we used to have in the, the old rule it was called we observe monastic observance and then in the new constitutions it was shifted a little bit to regular observance yeah. um, so just a change in term uh, but there is something there um, and there is a draw like to recover some of that monastic observance more of that in our life and so, yeah, we're not just parish, we're not just like parish priests who live together. 
uh, we are to have a strong monastic component. And we're rediscovering that in our own time and going deeper in that and uh, going deeper into prayer. And I think we are seeing that without that grounding in prayer, our preaching is weak. It's not anointed. It doesn't change hearts. It's, it's not going to transform the world. And we have to be rooted in prayer and then to hand on what we've contemplated. I'll just, you know, let me read just as kind of a concluding thing. What we read about St. Dominic and the seventh way of prayer, and it does capture him as a man of the gospel. And by being a man of the gospel, it means being a, a man of the Beatitudes and a man of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So not just preaching, passing on information, but handing on an anointed encounter with the Lord through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's what St. Dominic was about. That's what we as Dominicans are called to be about. And we need to go deeper and deeper in prayer to do that. But listen to what it says about St. Dominic and his seventh way of prayer. Dominic had his hand stretched right up above his head, joined together or slightly open as if to receive something from heaven. One would believe that he was receiving an increase of grace and was caught up in rapture, and that his prayer won from God for the order he had founded, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, a new outpouring of the gifts, a greater fullness of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and for himself and for his brethren, such delight and enjoyment in living the Beatitudes that each one would consider himself blessed in the most profound poverty, in bitter mourning, in severe persecution, in great hunger and thirst for righteousness, and solicitous mercy toward all. At such times, the Holy Father, St. Dominic, seemed suddenly to enter the Holy of Holies and the third heaven. And so after this kind of prayer, he truly seemed to be a prophet, truly a prophet of God whether in correcting the faulty, directing others, or in his preaching. Right, so to be men and women of the gospel is to be men and women of the Beatitudes, men and women of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and to have our preaching be anointed like that of a prophet, we need to seek the God on the mountain top in contemplation, in silence, in adoration, Eucharistic adoration, coming before the Lord and letting the light of the transfigured Christ enter into our hearts and from there radiating out to the world. That's St. Dominic's call and that's what we're striving for as Dominicans. Wow, yeah, Dominicanos, to be the dog with the torch, right? But we need, to, yeah. we need to get that fire first. Otherwise that's we right. can't spread the fire in prayer. Preach on. Amen. <laughs> okay, Father. Well, I think we our time is up. I'm, I'm sad that you're not here, but <laughs> yeah, hey. soon, soon. You soon, come very back soon, soon. Hopefully. Well, okay, Father, thank you so much for right. being God with us. God bless you all. Yeah, bless you. Yeah, bye, bless you. Bye-bye.
keep up the blessed work for Mary and the Lord Jesus Christ. With love, Jane. to Ask, Seek, and Knock. Now for the second part of the show, we, I have my husband here, Dr. Thomas Carr, who was a, a professor of philosophy and theology, of religious study. Right? Religious studies, for yeah. Sev 17 years. Is 17 that? long years, yes. Yes, very long. I was there. <laughs> you were. <laughs> <laughs> Too long. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I guess you want to talk about uh, St. Dominic. You want to add another point about him? I just had a story that I wanted to share, and I shared this here in Ave Maria on a couple of uh, public presentations that Ina and I made about the Dominican order. We were generating um, interest in the lay Dominicans for our new group that we were forming. And one of the stories I told, which I just really love about St. Dominic, now he's, he's famous for a number of things, but one of, them, one of the things he's famous for is that he he took on a, a very large group of heretics that were running rampant through southern France in the 1200s, uh, sorry, 12th century, and he confronted them head on and began preaching to them the, the gospel. And the, the, this, was, this is a group known as the Albigensians. They are kind of a quasi-Christian, quasi-Gnostic group took some ideas from this group and some ideas from that, kind of melded it together into a philosophy or way of life. In any case, he began preaching to them. And one of the things he did as a sort of evangelistic tool was that he would set up a stage in the center of town, in the main square. And then he would call the Albigensian teachers to the stage for a debate, for a public debate. And the Albigensians would present their version of the gospel, and then uh, St. Saint, Saint Dominic would show them where they were wrong with respect to the scriptures and church tradition. And he was in a small town, I, I don't remember the name of the town, but um, he was debating the Albigensians, and by all accounts from everybody that was there, there were some handwritten notes about that that we still have, uh, he won the debate. All the townspeople agreed he won the debate. The judges agreed that he won the debate. The only problem was that that whole town was under the authority or the, or the influence of the Albigensians. So no one dared say that St. Dominic won the debate. So they all just kind of threw up their hands and said, eh, it's a toss up, right? It was a, it was a tie. St. Dominic knew that he had the upper hand. So he gave a challenge to the Albigensians. He said, let's build a big fire in the center of the town. You throw your holy books onto the fire. I'll throw my holy books onto the fire. St. Dominic always traveled around with a copy of the New Testament, uh, sorry, a copy of the St. Matthew's Gospel and the letters of Paul. So he said, I'll throw my holy books onto the fire and we'll see which ones burn. So the Albigensians took him up on that uh, dare and they both threw their books on the fire. The Albigensians' books burned up instantly, 
St. Dominic's books actually, according to the tradition, rose up above the fire mm -hmm. and elevated in midair, proving that he had won the debate, that he, he was the holy, the holy one. So anyway, that's my one of my favorite stories. There's a beautiful painting that yeah, we have in our in our library, library of that. at home that depicts that very yeah, scene. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing how the saints, long time ago. I don't know why this is not happening today. Well, but, that that's actually a very good. Yeah, the question. Dominican saints. When you read about yeah. their story, the miracles that that revolves around them is in, is incredible. Yeah, you know there were so many saints, especially from the from about the. 300s to the 1400s, many, many saints during that stretch of time were, were called the, mirror, the, sorry, the wonder workers. They were wonder workers, which means that they were largely known for their miracles. Miracles of healing, miracles of bilocation, miracles of levitation, uh, just crazy, crazy things that defy the laws of nature, of course but don't defy the laws of God. And we don't see saints uh, living that way or, or expressing the gospel that way. It's just kind of sad. And it's a great question to ask, why, why not? Okay. Why are saints not known Hello, as Maria wonder Bishan. workers these days? Hi, uh, yes. I called earlier. Yes, yeah, what is, what's your name? My name's Jeffrey. Jeffrey, hi Jeffrey. Mm -hmm. You have a I, question for Dr. Carr? <laughs> well, I don't know who Dr. Carr is, or I don't. Is, is he on TV right now? Yes, he is. He's a, he's a theologian, so if you have any question about theology, about the church, you can ask him. Okay. Well, also, my interest is my sister and her, my brother in law live in Naples. My parents used to live there. Okay. And I'm up in, I'm up, I'm up in Bradenton. And so, one of my questions is. Uh -huh. Um, can one come down and visit the um, and Ave Maria College oh, or the sorry. campus? Uh, yeah, of course. Can, can I add, Doctor? Yeah, put, put it on yeah. your headphone. Hi, hi, Jeff. This is Tom Carr calling or talking to you. Thank you hi. for calling the, into the show. Uh, just to let you know that yeah, Ave Maria is the town here, about uh, 35 minutes east of Naples and okay. not not it wouldn't be that far to come down from Bradenton you take 75 south and then turn left on uh, on Immokalee Road and the, uh, the the chapel here the parish church beautiful parish church built in a uh, style that imitates Frank, um, Lord Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright and oh. uh, Art Deco it's open from about six in the morning till nine o'clock at night, so that's open and available to you. The we have an adoration chapel that's open at five o'clock in the morning, closes at midnight. That would be open. We have a uh, Mother, Teresa, Mother Museum. Teresa Museum, which is on the campus of Ave Maria University, that is open to the public throughout the day. And there are other things to see and do here in Ave Maria. It's a wonderful town to visit. You probably would want to come down during term time of the university because there are all sorts of programs that go on at the university. You, you can see a Shakespeare play, you can sit in on a class, you can hear world-renowned speakers giving lectures on this or that. So yeah, you're welcome to come down any time. Okay, well, um, what, um, is, what town would I actually be coming to if, if I wanted to look for a lodging, like a, a hotel or something oh, and stay a few days? Nothing. Maybe you can call back later. Right. Um, just wanted to get your your question on the speaker here. So you were asking what, where would one stay when one comes into town? Maybe you can call back later. Why don't, why don't we uh, oh. defer this? We can talk a bit yeah. later about this rather than on the show. Oh, I, I didn't realize we're on the show. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. That's all right. All right, Jeff. We'll talk later about that. Thank you very much for calling. Okay. Okay. Bye now. You can. Well, we are promoting the town of <laughs> well, Ave Maria. Yeah, this, <laughs> That's sorry, you've, you've tuned in to the <laughs> Welcome to Ave Maria show. <laughs> it's a wonderful town because our it is, yeah. uh, priest, our friar that came, they, they just want to live here. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, we had two Dominican friars. One lives in Rome, Italy. One lives in New York City. And they both prefer living here in Ave Maria. They were here just for a week, and they want to come back, and they would like to, to move here one day if possible. 
So it is a beautiful town. There's a, a wonderful Catholic atmosphere in the town. You've got all kinds of programs going on for kids, young adults, adults, uh, sponsored by the parish. And the easy way to make friends, an easy way to build community. And you, you feel like you're, you're in a town that it goes right back to the 1950s. Yeah, it's a, it's a holy swamp, we call it, because yeah. kids go to school by bike. Right. Uh, it's a very safe place, yes. And kids are always running around. You see them on their bikes. You know, they're 8, 9, 10 years old, and they're off on their own, and everybody is okay with that because it's a safe place. Okay, what is it that you want to say about St. Dominic? Oh, I did already. I uh, shared my story. Yeah, you were going to say something about miracles. Why don't miracles oh, happen? Oh, well, you ask a very, asked a very good question about, mm -hmm. you know, we, we hear of these amazing stories of miraculous events happening in the lives of the saints from centuries ago. Then we look at the saints of today, and there, there, are, there are quite a few, right? St. John Paul II or... Pierre uh, Giorgio Frassati or um, Blessed Bartolo Longo. I, I think he actually had some mir miracles in his life. Thinking more of the 21st century saints or 20th century saints, and you just, they're not known as wonder workers. They're known as men and women of heroic faith, of heroic virtue. They're known as, as, um, as men and women who love the Lord, who display amazing devotion, but they're not necessarily known as those who um, perform miracles. Now, many of them, of course, they wouldn't be saints if they weren't able to perform a couple of miracles after their death through intercession. So that's a given, but they weren't known as wonder workers in their lives. And the question is why? Why is it that so many saints in the past had these tremendous miracles associated with them, their prayer, their, their lives. I mean, it was a beautiful story. Well, I don't know how, if it's beautiful, but it's an intriguing story. And boy, I'm, re I'm forgetting the name of the saint that this happened to. But he stood in front of a pagan temple. He condemned it in the name of the Lord, and it crumbled and fell. And then on the on the rubble, they built a beautiful Christian Sounds church. Like an Old Testament prophet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very prophetic. It was yeah. in the first in the first millennium, I think, of the Christian era. Uh, well, it you know part of it is that um, we live in an age of science where so much of the natural world is known. We know how it operates. We know about the laws of causation. We understand the natural mechanisms of things like gravity and, and so on. And maybe we just know too much, <laughs> you know. In, in former times where they didn't know as much about the natural world, they didn't know that they were violating the laws of nature. Today we have a sort of a higher bar to, to get over in terms of believing in the miracle. So that may be part of it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe less less saint. I don't know. Maybe life, life is too comfortable. Well, it certainly you know? is very comfortable. Yeah, we were talking in our lay Dominican group about how, you know, in, in St. Dominic's day, they performed really quite radical penance. So flagellation was quite common. In fact, it's one of the nine forms of prayer that St. Dominic recommended to the brothers that he had. And that was where they would take a whip, right? And they would s smack their back with this whip yeah. 10, 20, 30 times a day, sometimes drawing blood, but often creating at least a lot of pain. And that was a form of reparation for their own sins and reparation for the sins of others and offering up that sacrifice to God. And, uh, and we don't do that today. Nobody flagellates themselves. I mean, there are some forms of, of uh, penitential sacrifice of that sort, but not nearly to that extreme. Now, the, one of the things we have to realize is that in Dominic's day, life was very uncomfortable. He didn't have air conditioning, didn't have central well, that's plumbing. That's probably why they become saint. <laughs> and and <laughs> maybe that's why. Maybe we are We're in comatose, far too comfortable. comatose. Too much yeah. food, too comfortable, it's watch a, TV. It's a very interesting yeah. question. Why the connection between physical suffering yeah. and holiness, growth and holiness? Yeah. 
What uh, is that connection? As, as a new convert, I always, I did not understand because yeah. as a Protestant, you don't do this. And, right. and I'm reading a lot of the saints, like why are they so, you know, they hurt themselves. So, yeah. uh, you know, they, they put chain in their stomach yeah. right until it bleeds, until it goes inside their skin. They why take their they shoes off when they're hiking around, yeah. even through bramble bushes and over rocks mm -hmm. and so on. I remember uh, a saint, uh, he's not a saint actually, but Thomas Akempis, who wrote The Imitation of Christ, would cut a hole in the bottom of his shoe so that he could feel the road wherever he went. And I remember not think, reading that, not... Well, St. Dominic doesn't wear shoes between town. He would take off his shoes. Exactly, yeah. Same thing, yeah. yeah. And, you know, St. Bridget of Sweden, I talked about a couple of shows ago, mm -hmm. would uh, take cold baths in the middle of a Swedish winter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they probably had to chip through the ice to get, to get into the bathtub. And yeah. there was, she had a confessor who is not canonized a saint, although there was a, a cause for his uh, canonization, but he would throw himself in the snow in the winter and throw himself in the rose bushes in the summer. We we can't we can't understand that and and yet that is connected intimately with with sanctity. So are you suggesting that we should do that? I again? think we should. Yeah, I do. I think that you can start tomorrow. You and I <laughs> we just get a couple of whips. We can flagellate each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, Saint John Vianney, I know is famous for that too. He used to. I think he used to put himself like on the cross in his bedroom, blood everywhere on the wood, mm. wooden floor. He eats like, potato yeah. and, you know, and sleep on the plank of wood. But yeah. I know as he got older, he kind of stopped doing that. Yeah, a, that lot of, a lot of the saints did A lot that. of the saints, actually, St. Bridget of Sweden got to about 40 years old. Her health was not real good. She had, was still a mother and had to care for the family. And her confessor said, stop, stop beating yourself up. Focus on the interior. Uh, vices that you have instead of the exterior and she did and actually her spiritual life flourished after that so there's yeah. it seems like the the physical um, penitential approach to faith is a kind of breaking of the ground right it's it's kind of the the, the, the entrance into yeah, yeah. the narrow path that Jesus talks about uh, but really, the, the deeper work is what is essential, having to deal with the heart, our own hearts, our hardened hearts, yeah. and the, the evil thoughts that we have in our heads. Th those are the things that, of course, Jesus wants us to, to get rid of. Yeah. Well, the physical penance help us to get rid of all the vices. Yes, you know? it does help to that so. end. And I think also, in my mind at least, the, the real um, merit that is gained from physical penance is the merit that is needed to repair my sins, make reparation for my sins, and for those that I love, who may not be in a position where they can give atonement for their sins. So I do it on their behalf. Right? I take punishment on myself that they would otherwise deserve, and therefore they have a lighter sentence, and I earn some merit. Yeah. <laughs> it's a win-win. Okay. Well, I think that's all we have time for now. You want to close in prayer? Sure. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to speak with our friends through Ave Maria Vision. And uh, we ask you, Lord, for a blessing upon uh, Father Ignatius, my wife and myself, as we share our thoughts and hearts with the people who watch. And we ask for a blessing on them as well, and on Maria Vision itself and all that to work here. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week. Thank you for watching.